Okay, so why this module? Why muscle control? To put it simply, it's just about learning to control and contract the muscles as much in isolation as possible so that they can contribute to the whole with a lot more control and effectiveness. I know for me and probably for most of you as well, most of my training has been focused on either moving an object, whether it's a weight, a kettlebell, a rope, uh, or, or a sporting object like a football, a tennis racket and a ball, a snooker cue, whatever it is for you, or mimicking someone's action. So I see someone moving in a way that I want to move, so I try to copy that. So it's very externally cued focus. This is a chance, we, this is the both sides utilize effect. We've done that and we can continue to do that as well. But this is a real opposite approach to the body where we're going very internally focused and we're actually tuning into what, okay, can I control that muscle? Okay, when that muscle's on, why is that muscle also on? And can I turn that muscle off? Because that's a waste of energy right there. So it's going from an externally cued focus to an internal one. And it's just given us a chance to practice this at a very simple and foundational level. So recently I've been teaching myself to play music. I've never done it my whole life and yet I love music. I've always had some sort of emotional block to actually confronting that and getting over the hurdle of just learning and just putting the time in day after day. And as I'm learning to play music, I'm learning chords. And on the guitar, that's a series, you press several strings at the same time in certain positions and you strum and it will make a harmonious sound with all those different fingers being pressed down or on the keyboard, the piano, you press C, E and G together and that's a major C chord. Those different notes together make a wonderful sounding chord, a harmonious chord. Now if I move one finger to the left or to the right, there's, there's a chance that it might sound disharmonious, it might become discord. Or if I add an, a fourth finger or an extra finger is touching a string when it shouldn't be, then suddenly it sounds disharmonious. C, G, E. Right. If we button bash and we add the F in by accident, it doesn't sound good. C, B, E. Doesn't sound good. C, G, E. B, G, E. That's a chord. C, A, E. That's a chord. C, B, E, not good. C, B, G, not good. And so for me, this is how I'm starting to see, as an analogy, for movement patterns is like a deadlift or a squat or a throw is a series of notes, a series of muscles that have to work together to create a harmonious movement action. And when muscles are firing, when notes are played that we don't want played, it creates more disharmony and this can lead to injuries and, and less results or less less of a big jump or less of a far throw or whatever it is that we're after, less control overall. So it's learning to play the notes and which notes we cannot play at the same time to create more control in the body so that we can have more fun with it. Going through Maxic's approach to muscle control, one of the big proponents of the practice that he constantly stresses is learning to relax the other muscles, learning to not play the notes that we don't want to play to make the harmonious sound. So if, for example, if we just mimic a bicep curl, or say we just squeeze the bicep, we squeeze the bicep, many of us might also be squeezing the shoulder, the tricep, we just send a, a like, so kind of localized signal to the area, but the region of the arm, I'm gonna send energy and then contract that with that energy. And so therefore we might have yes, shoulder, tricep, forearm involved, but if I say just contract the bicep, and it now tune into is the shoulder involved, is the tricep involved, can you consciously, intentionally take less tension? Like you might not be able to take all the tension out of those muscles, but you can take some. It might be 1%, it might be 5%, it might be 20% as you get better at it. So it's, it's simply that. So if you think about what's going on there, if I'm telling my arm or telling my bicep to contract, but there's also energy going into the tricep, well, that's a waste of energy, which is going to send blood flow there. And then if I actually wanted to do the action of a bicep curl, and the motion is that I want to pull a weight from here to here using this muscle, which shortens as I do, if the tricep is engaged, well, the tricep, when that shortens, when the tricep contracts, that does this motion. So I'm pulling with my bicep against the tricep. So not only am I wasting energy and blood flow to that region, I'm also having to work against that. So the more I'm able to control and switch that muscle off while 
contracting the muscle I want to contract to do the motion I want to do, we're removing two losses of energy and then the energy to work against that muscle so it becomes a double win. So you can think of this training like learning an instrument and the instrument is the body and we want to be precise about the notes that we're trying to play. In the words of Maxic, the aim of these exercises is not to create a heavily muscled Hercules but to turn out men and women who are harmonious in appearance, healthy of body and strong of spirit. When they developed this stuff and physical culture was a thing, there was a greater honus on health and well-being. There wasn't social media, there wasn't steroids and, and bodybuilding competitions. It was a holistic package of feeling healthy and being able to express that with what they could do with their bodies. Now, Maxic is a, a one of a kind in what he was able to do, some of the feats of strength that he was able to do. If you look into his story, I might share some of it here. He truly was a phenom. And so if, testimony to that was these natural intuitive methods that he developed. Just like music, I believe that exercising is also an art. And to do so in an intelligent way where we learn to control the instrument so that we can use it for, for ourselves and for our own enjoyment. So a practice like this that seems so foundational and fundamental and mindful and intuitive and internal seems like a key step for us all to try on the journey to mastery. I hope that this module on muscle control and the discoveries of Maxic give you as much inspiration as it's given to me. Thanks for watching. Okay, so how do we do muscle control? So to put it simply, we're just going to go around almost every muscle in the body that we can find, and we're gonna put it through a series of contractions whilst we're gonna think about relaxing the surrounding muscles. Now, this is about, as Maxic stresses frequently, coaxing the muscles to nurture them with healthy blood flow and nourishment to help them to grow and to become soft and supple and strong rather than about exhausting. So we're not going to do peak contractions where a whole body is vibrating. We're just trying to gently work in, kneading the muscle with contractions and then relaxation, contraction, relaxation, pulsing through the body. Sometimes we'll do holds, sometimes we'll do pulsing. We're not working on any one body part or muscle for more than, say, one or two minutes. Most of the contractions will be done, especially when you're new to this in the beginning, at short range. So it's a lot easier to focus on a muscle contraction when we're short range is when the muscle is shortened, whatever we need to do to shorten the muscle. And then as we get better, we can start to focus on some long range contractions and then really build control at length. This is a very natural and intuitive method. There are no weights, no sets no reps, maybe a mirror if you want. For some, Maxic talks about using a mirror to check if the muscle is contracted that you're trying to contract. Rather than looking at it, trying to contract, which is gonna give us an external cue, you try to contract the muscle, whatever it is, and then check in the mirror to see if it is contracted. So there are some uh, of these, like the stomach vacuum and the traps, which you probably will want to have a mirror present for if you can, but as I said, try to use it only to check after you've contracted the muscle, or you think you've contracted the muscle to see if it is contracted. You can also use your finger as well. But the main tool here, which I love about this system and is just shows how natural and kind of God-given and intuitive it is, is our mind, is the internal intention. And as we do this, we're creating those internal neural pathways from the brain to the muscle, the mind-muscle connection over and over again. So this is about just those repetitions over days, weeks, months of getting more control and more of an internal dialogue going with our body. One of the things I really like when we train like this is it allows us to find much more range whilst going through positions. So you'll see when we're doing some of the, the tricep extensions, we're able to do it rather than just a press here or a press here or a side press. You can get tricep extension in all of these different ranges, which the body is a series of lever systems, basically. It's all leverage. So when, I'm, when my shoulder's here, there are other muscles involved. The tension on the tricep is different to when I'm working here, but I still want to be able to be able to function and control the muscle in all these ranges. So it allows a lot more freedom whilst being a lot less risk than having any weights because it's all on us. How much, the contract, how much we contract is dependent on us and there's no external force that can come in to injure us. Now, I do, that's not to say I don't believe that there is a place for, for weights and kettlebell training and all that stuff. I do think there's a huge important place for that when it comes to strengthening the tendons, 
training kind of ballistic strength into the, the muscles and the joints. And when it comes to training sequences of movements together, but I just like this as the opposite end of the spectrum to that training. One thing that I've frequently heard uh, like top athletic coaches say, Weck said it and other people as well that makes a lot of sense to me is the best athletes are the ones that are able to fire the muscles and then relax the muscles. And that way you're efficient with what you're doing. You're getting maximum power out and then you're not wasting any energy and you're moving on to the next part of the body that needs to go. And so this training is gonna to contribute towards that. Not only are we training to contract, we're training to relax as well. So we're, we're getting, we're, again, we're getting stuck out of the middle like we did with the stability training where a lot of us, our muscles are stuck half on, half off. We're training them on, we're training them off. And Maxic talks a lot about how this training makes the muscles become supple and soft. And that's what I, I feel as well is that hard muscles are scared muscles. So you can think of this as sort of another rite of passage. That's something I wish I did when I was at home when I was 10, 12 years old, before you're old enough to go to the gym. And you know, children that age shouldn't lift weights and stuff anyway, right? Just learning. Imagine if we taught children to practice the contractions. Children kind of naturally like to flex and play with that anyway. So in a way, it's as a development on that, but it's our chance now to put in the time to do this rite of passage to become more controlled with our muscles. Sometime about 120 years ago, Maxic moved to England from Germany, teamed up with Montesaldo and created the Max Alding system. Now that's what I've been going over for the last three to four months. And so what I've created here is a series compiled of some of the most, what I find the most effective movements from that system and then some of my own intuitive discoveries as well. What I find best for me and what I like about this is if I do it two to three times a week, I notice that I make progress, I'm making gains and each session lasts no more than 30 to 45 minutes. If I do just the upper body up to 30 minutes, if I'm doing lower body as well and depends how deep I get into that, about 45 minutes. So it's not every day, it's not an hour long, it's just a nice two to three times a week and then if I want to, after I've done those sessions, I can go and do some kettlebells, do some weights, do some calisthenics feels really nice and I really go slow, mindful warrior style controlled into the calisthenics feels good. You can do rope flow and I feel more harmony. It's a good, rope flow is a great test to see if you do feel different after this kind of training. So it's not like this is going to take up all your time and it's not going to take up all your sessions. Then on the days in between, if you want, if you want to just do these sessions, then the days in between you can do that other stuff, the weights, calisthenics, whatever it is that you like to do. Just a quick note on breathing. Breathing should be relaxed throughout the whole thing and through the nose. If you find yourself out of breath, other than on the vacuum, of course, then you've gone too far. You need to rest more or contract less intensely. Well, there are two main keys to this that I've gone over, but I'll go over them again here just to reiterate. Number one, it's about coaxing the muscles, nourishing the muscles, bathing the, the muscles in healthy blood flow. When you do it right, it feels intuitive. It feels nourishing. It feels like the muscle wants to go through that motion. And then there will come a point when it feels like, yeah, I'm done now. I want to move on to something else. The more you do it, the more intuitive you find. You'll be able to find muscles in your body that you want to activate that you're like, oh, that feels good. It doesn't feel like I've activated that for the last 20 years of my life. I've never used this range here or this muscle here. Coaxing the muscle and feeling into the muscle. It should, like I say, feel nice, feel satisfying. And then number two, is the practice of relax. Now the practice of relax might be something that you want to think about after maybe you've done a week or a few weeks of just focus on the contraction. It's up to you. You can do it in the beginning or if you want to just focus on the contraction to start with so you're not overloaded. And then in a few weeks and maybe a month in, you can then start to go over the same series of movements and then start to think about, okay, in this position, can I relax any muscles? Or can I tune into if the muscles, you know, feeling with your finger, using a mirror if you want to use a mirror, or just sensing, oh, my lat's on when I'm trying to find my pec. Can I turn that off? 1%, 5%, whatever it is for you. Just to triple down on the relaxation talk, I've got some examples here of things that I like to play with as I'm going, different muscles and the muscles around them that might want to kick in. So as you're listening to this, just have a play if you want to as well. So we've gone over the bicep one, when you tense your bicep, does the shoulder get involved? Does the tricep get involved? Can you relax them? When you relax them, does this, does this affect the strength you're able to put into the bicep? So we've also got the lats. When you contract your lats, these muscles here, is your shoulders getting involved? Is your pecs getting involved? Is your traps getting involved? With your shoulders, when you contract your shoulders, does your lats get involved? Does your neck and your pecs get involved as well? 
when you contract your traps, this was a big one for me, learning to contract my traps was a huge win for me early on because the other muscles I could kind of play with, traps, I had literally no control over my, my traps. Then when I started to get control, my neck wants to crank forward like this. So when you contract your traps up here, if you can do that, and I'm going to guide you through it if you can't, does your neck get involved? Do your shoulders get involved? Do your lats get involved? Or can you keep them relaxed? Can you squeeze your quads, your thigh muscles, without your calf getting involved and your glutes getting involved? Can you squeeze your calf without your foot being contracted as well? And if you're lying on your belly, can you contract your lower back, maybe using your hands to support you, without contracting the glutes? And vice versa, can you contract the glutes without contracting the lower back? So we'll get them firing first. So with your thumbs just kind of on your sides, just work on contracting the lats neutrally. So do both sides at the same time. 